Um, I heard a story the other day um, about a teacher, and uh, she was wanted to do something different with her class, and she um, so she she wanted them to understand who they were and part of their background of gr- ra- um, uh, growing up in a family. And so each one of the kids had a different kind of religious background. And she said, well, let's do this. Why don't you come in and show and tell? And everybody can kind of reveal kind of what their religious background is. And so the next day, you know, the first kid up was Benjamin. And he, he said, um, I'm Jewish, and uh, this is the Star of David. And the next little kid got up, and it was Mary, and she said, I'm Catholic, and this is a crucifix. And the next little boy got up, and his name Tommy, and he says, I'm Baptist, and this is a casserole. (laughs) And so that was his indicator of what church was, right? So today I get the privilege of continuing a series that Pastor David started called Greater Than. Today I get to talk about the greater than the voice of God in us. So we're going to get to talk about what it is to hear God's voice, what it means even to the practical of how to actually hear from God. Uh, The number one question with churchgoers is this, how do I hear God's voice? The second one is, how do I know what God's plan is for my life? I think if we figure out the first one, I think the second one would take care of itself. How do I hear God's voice? How do I tune in to hearing God's voice? I hear God talking all the time. Are people saying that they hear God all the time? How do I tune into what they're hearing? You know, I think sometimes in church, I know sometimes me, when I ask the Lord for something, direction, I kind of wish that he would speak to us like he did in the Old Testament, you know? The, the pillars of smoke or the pillars of fire or a bush that's on fire, you know, Moses as he walks out. Sometimes I just wish as I'm praying like, Lord, I just want to walk outside and just turn a bush on fire and, and speak to me that way, you know, or, or whatever. And, and, and so, I, and I don't know if you're like me, I just like, Lord, let it be just big and so that I know that you're speaking. But I'll tell you what, I think the Old Testament people would rather be in our position. Because you see, the Holy Spirit would rest on them in the Old Testament. He'd rest on them for a time. He'd rest on them for either as long as the task would be that, he was being, that they were being asked to do or until they were disobedient. And then the Holy Spirit would pull off of them, would, would, would leave them. But for us, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit lives in you. He's united with your spirit. And because of that, nothing can take that away from you. Nothing on heaven or earth can take that out of you. The Holy Spirit resides in you. And so I think if I was in the Old Testament, I'd be like, man, they have it so good. The Holy Spirit actually resides in them, actually gives them power all day long, all the time, and they can hear him all the time. But that obviously isn't the case if that's the number one question in church, how do I hear God? So today we're going to dive into that. How do I hear God? How do I hear and, and can I hear God? But before we dive in, let's, let's just ask the Holy Spirit now even just to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we, we just, we thank you that you reside in us. Father, we thank you that you sent your son that died on the cross and that we know that we're his because you deposited the Holy Spirit inside of us as a seal. Father God, I thank you for that. And Holy Spirit, we just ask that you speak to our hearts, that you speak to our minds, that you give us understanding and revelation. Lord, we don't want to leave here without being changed by the power of your word. Father God, give us an expectation in our hearts to hear you right now. Lord, we want to hear from you. We came here to hear from you, Lord. And so we surrender to you. We surrender our hearts. We surrender our minds. We surrender our ears. Speak to us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. John chapter 8, verse 47 says this. I'm sorry. Yep, I skipped over a whole bunch. John chapter 8, we're just going to go today. How about that? You guys okay with that? John chapter 8, verse 47 says this. 
Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. This is a, a pretty blatant statement here, a pretty straightforward statement. Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The great thing about this is, is that if you're a child of God, this is a statement of fact. You hear from him. You hear from him. It's not just pastors and it's not just worship leaders and it's not just amazing men and women of God. Everybody, if you are a child of God, you hear from him and he speaks to you. This is a fact. This is a declaration that's being given by Jesus. You hear from God. And in fact, because you hear from him, that means that you're his. I think a lot of times we think that Jesus died he died to save me, and he died, he loves me enough to die for me, but he doesn't love me enough to speak to me. Like, yeah, he saved me, but he doesn't really want anything else to do with me from there. Or maybe he does, but he doesn't want to talk to me or spend time with me all day long. And so we think he loves me, of course, to do this, but does he love me enough to be intimate and spend time with me? A.W. Tozer says this. He says, the one who does not expect God to speak will discount every single time that God speaks, that God does speak. You see, having an expectation that God will speak to you or that you have the right as a child of God to speak to you, if you have that expectation and understand what you actually have as a child, and if you come with that, then you will hear God. But if you don't think that you can or that you will, as A.W. Tozer said, then every time the Lord speaks, you'll find a reason why it's not him. I love the scripture here, John chapter 10, 14, 14 and 15. It says this. It says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for my sheep. Down further, 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I love that because it's an indication of intimacy, an ind indication of relationship that he has, that I know my sheep and they know me just as I know my father. I mean, we think about the relationship between Jesus and the father, and we think of the most, the most intimate, the most one. They're united. They are one. And we think of that relationship, and he says, I know my sheep just like I know my father, and he knows me. My sheep know me. You see, in Jesus' time, he uses this illustration at the beginning of chapter 10. He uses this illustration of a flock of sheep. Back in the day, if you had an area where there was green pastures, uh, um, a shepherd would have a flock and it could be up to a hundred sheep. And so at night they would, or during the day, they would spend all day with their sheep. They knew their sheep. They knew them intimacy. They knew each one of them exactly. They would talk to them. They would call them. They knew exactly what each one looked like. But at night when they would, when they, uh, when the, to, they would, uh, to protect them, they would move into um, a pin or a fold, they called it. And basically what it was was a walled, rock-walled area that was just squared off and only had one entrance. And this one entrance was the gate. And so they would all, say you had 10 shepherds around this area, all 10 of them would bring them to this one area and they'd put their sheep in there for protection. And they'd put all of their sheep in. So if you had 10 sheep and 100 sheep, you'd have about 1,000 sheep in this area. And you put them all in there. And then one guy, he's called the porter, would stay with the sheep. And it, sometimes it was one of the shepherds. But what would, they would do is they would actually come into the area where the one entryway, the one gate, and they actually were the gate. They would actually lay down in the entrance of the gate. They would lay there so they would know that no sheep were leaving and no one would be coming in. Now, all the other shepherds would go into town and go back to sleep. Now, when they would come back in, that porter would get up and he would look to see if those shepherds that were coming were part of these sheep. And so if they did what to do, the, the porter would move out of the way and let the shepherd in. And that shepherd would stand there in front of this flock of thousands, a thousand sheep. And he would say, whatever his call was to his sheep, 
and he would call them. And no matter where those sheep were in this area with a thousand, as he walked out of that pen, as he walked out of that gate, every single one of his sheep would follow him. They would follow him, every single one of them, one after another. No other sheep would follow him but his. They knew what his voice sounded like. You see, he knew them, and they knew him. They had this intimate relationship with each other. They knew each other. He knew what was going on in each one of their little lives, and, and they knew him as their protector. The reality of this is that if we don't actually have a relationship with God, we're never going to hear God. Which means that if I don't hear God, then I have to ask myself, do I have a relationship with God? Because a relationship with God is this. It's intimacy. It's knowing who he is and letting him know who you are and you listening to him. I've said this before, what kind of relationship would I have with my wife if I did all the talking? I'd have a terrible relationship. And that's how I believe some of us do. We, we, we talk to God in our prayer and we just do all the talking and then get up and walk away. Now, what I want to do is this. I, I, I want to break down exactly what it is to hear God's voice. I want to do just a practical understanding of what it is to hear God's voice and what it means to hear God's voice. Because the reality is, is that when we think about hearing God's voice, it could be kind of theoretical. Like we can think about it in a thought process like, oh, do you hear God? Oh, I hear God. Yeah, I read his word. His word is God's word. I hear it. I read it. And so it could be this kind of theory of hearing God's voice, but the reality is unless we put it into a practical and actually make it work to where it's actually affecting our life, then, it's, then it doesn't have any power. And so what I want to do is this. I, I want to just break down exactly what it is and how it is and what his voice sounds like. The first thing is this. We look at our, we, we, we try and think about in your head, and I think this is probably the biggest question is, how do I know it's God's voice? How do I know that's God's voice speaking to me? Well, there's three voices or three thoughts that come into your mind. It's either going to be your mind or your thought or your voice that you hear. Now, your voice is your mind, your will, your emotion, and your conscience, right? Your mind, if it's like my mind, is all over the place. Right? I'm, a, I'm, from, I'm like a squirrel sometimes. Like I'm, I'll get half things done over here, half things done over there, and I'm like, oh, I got to do this. And so I'm like, man, Lord, if, my, my, if I had to dictate my life by my mind, I wouldn't get anything done. My mind, my will. My will is, is anchored in selfishness. We grew up with a flesh that was sinful, and in that, the center of that is my will. I want what I want, and I want it now. Emotions. Man, emotions change like the wind. I mean, I could be sitting in front of the TV and watch a Hallmark commercial cry and then get in my car and drive, and someone pulls in front of me, and I'm mad now, right? I mean, there's this, like, constant changing of emotion. And then our conscience our conscience, I had a, uh, uh, a youth ask me the other day, we were camping and, and the whole camping trip was about hearing God and just moments where we try and just spend time hearing God's voice. And one of them said, why well, is, is my conscience, I mean, I, I'm, I listen to my conscience. I'm like, well, that's great, but that's not God's voice. You see, your conscience is made up of all the things you grew up with. Like it's the things, the traditions, the, the things your parents put on you, the things that maybe your situations gave to you. And so it molds your conscience and your right and wrong. And sometimes your conscience does not line up with the word of God. In fact, I was talking about this on the car ride here and my daughter Maya said, but what if you have godly parents? And I said, well, that's the goal. Right? As godly parents, my goal is to help mold your conscience to where it lines up with the Word of God. Not lines up with my conscience, not lines up with my traditions of growing up. 
but lines up with the Word of God. That's parenting, right? That's the whole goal. So there's the mind, the will, the emotion, and your conscience. That's the majority of the thoughts that come in our head. We like to blame some of those on the enemy, right? Oh, that was so the devil. No, that was just you, right? That was actually just, that came from deep inside you. The second one is this, the world. The second one is the world. I have no idea where I am on these. Uh, the world. Second <laughs> uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. It says, Satan, who is the God, little g, of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Satan is the God of this world. He controls like strings on a puppet. He controls it and tries to manipulate what we think about ourselves. He tries to give us our identity. He tries to tell us what it means to be a man. He tries to tell us what it means to be a woman. He tries to tell us what it means to be a conservative or a liberal. He tries to tell us what it means to be a child of God even. And he, with social media and all that, I mean, we have it harder than probably most generations behind us because it's in our face constantly. And it's telling us who we should be apart from who God says we are. And so we take on these voices constantly bombarded around us of of our identity. And the third one is God's voice. God's voice through the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 says this, one of my favorite verses, it says, and now you Gentiles, you guys, that's all you out there, have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. That you were, that when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. As his sheep, he identified you by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. He deposited in you the Holy Spirit and that was his seal that you're his. That was his seal. He says, this this child is mine and I'm putting the Holy Spirit. You see, see, in John, when Jesus was leaving, he says, you're going to do greater things than I. I have to leave. And the disciples were like, no, what do you mean? He's like, no, you can't receive the Holy Spirit until I leave. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, what's going to happen is it's going to seal you for the Lord. And it's going to make a way to where you can now hear from God. And so this is where we hear God. This is how we do it. It's through the Holy Spirit. And I'll, I'll just say a side note. A lot of times we try and hear God out here. You know, I don't know if you've ever done this. Like you're like, okay, I'm, if I open up my Bible and it lands on a verse that says, have you ever done that before? Okay, only half of you. Come on, all of us have. Or you've, or you've done this where you turn the radio on and you, oh, that song came on. Or you do this or whatever it is. We try and hear God from out here when the reality is, is the Holy Spirit is here. And he's speaking to us here, here, and here. And he's speaking to us all day long. And yet we try and find out here where God is and his voice. So those are the three voices that we hear. Now, how do we know what his voice sounds like from those other three? How do we look at those three voices and say, okay, that's not it, that's not it, that's me, that's the world and, and the enemy, and that's God. How do I know that his voice and how does it sound different than the rest? There's three ways to find out. The first one and the primary way is the word of God. The word of God. The word of God is how you get the character of God. You know, if somebody were to come to me and say that Anna said something vindictive or 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 tearing down of somebody else, like they said, oh, Anna, my wife, Anna. If they said Anna said this about this person and tore them down and and belittled them and, and made them feel small. If they said that to me, I would say, 
No, she didn't. And then, what do you mean? I know my wife's character. That's what I'd say. I've heard her talk over and over again over the past 20 years, and I know she's never said anything like that. In fact, when I try to, she always pulls me back, and that makes me mad. Just join me in this, please. They're bad people, whatever. I try and get her and pull her in. Not a very good pastor or husband, but I'm telling you, I know her character because I hear her. I hear her speak. I know it over the accumulation of all the things that she has said makes, in my mind, an understanding of who she is, her character. And as I read the word of God that is alive and active, by the way, as I read the word and I start putting it inside of me, what I start doing is I start building an understanding of the character of God. I start putting in my mind an understanding like, oh, he wouldn't say that. That thought that just came in, no, actually, he wouldn't say that because I know his character. I've read enough of his word to understand that this is who he is. He's love. He's peace. He's gentleness. He's kindness. He's self-control. I know who he is. I know his character. And if you're not reading the word of God, I hear people all the time. It's like, why am I not hearing the Lord? And I said, well, are you reading the word? Well, I do every once in a while. There's your first step. Because what you're doing is you're adding to your, your understanding of what his voice is going to say. And it always, 100%, always, you could take this to the bank, this is a fact, always lines up with the word of God. If, he, if it is not in there, he didn't say it. Always. So I have to read it. I have to get into the word of God. It's a must. Number two is this, his family, his family, all of you in here. This is how I hear the Lord too. And this is how I gauge and I use you guys, the family, wise counsel as a barometer if it's God's word or not. I use you guys. You guys, see, this is the thing about the church. The church is God's plan A and he doesn't have a plan B. Okay, the church is so necessary. And I hear Christians more and more today say, oh, I have my own relationship with the Lord. I don't need to be attached to a body. Let me tell you this. Then you're missing out. You're missing out on what God has for you. You're missing out on the fullness that he has for you. And I'll tell you this. You won't grow nearly as much if you were in a family than if you're not. You see, the great thing about a family is that the people around you, even though they bug you, and annoy you sometimes and say things that they shouldn't or whatever it is, you choose to be with them despite that. And the Holy Spirit breaks off a little bit more. And then somebody says something, and instead of being mad at them and being uh, 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 coming back and trying to hurt them back, you come back with love and say, man, I forgive you, breaks off a little bit more, smooths out the area, You start to be revealing who Christ said you are, but you need the people around you to sharpen you. You need them to rub against you. You need them to, in, in a, like in a river, the, the water to rush over it to smooth out those areas. And then you need them and they need you. You see, we're a family. He, it's, it's, not, it's not clever writing. It's actually true. We're a family. We all have a new identity and a new DNA because we're new creations and he made us together to be brothers and sisters and we need each other. And so wise counsel, we have uh, uh, um, uh, Proverbs eleven fourteen says this, it says, where there is no guidance, a people fall, but in the abundance of counsel, there is safety. What does it save you from? It saves you from pain, it saves you from wasting your time. It saves you from hurt. If I have a group of men around me that I say, hey, can I bounce this off of you? Is this the Lord? And, and all three of them say to me, um, no. Then I know, even if I have one that says, Dave, I think you need to rethink that. 
And I think, honestly, some of us don't tell people what we think the Lord is saying because we know that the majority of them are going to say, no, that's not the Lord. And so we don't actually want to do life with people because we know that they're going to maybe call us out and we're not ready to stop doing that stuff. And so we don't want brotherhood or we don't want sisterhood or we don't want a family that helps us and helps us grow and strengthens us. But if you have something and you're like, man, this is the Lord, I'm going to move to this place, but I'm not going to tell anybody, then that's probably a red flag because you know what they're going to say. This is how we hear the Lord and he designed it that way for a reason. We need each other. The third way is this. The third way is this. His tone. I love this. His tone and his, his timbre. How he sounds. This I love uh, because I know that God's voice always has a feel to it. Romans 8 says this. We all know this verse. He says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. If you are feeling condemnation about something, if you're feeling uh, a weight or a depression or a uh, um, you're not good enough feeling, that isn't the Lord. That's the enemy. I wrote this down, uh, a quote. Uh, it says, he never attacks your value. If you start getting, you're not good enough, you can't do this, you're, not, you're, uh, you're never going to do it right, you're always going to do that over again, why stop? If you start hearing that, that is not the Lord. That is the enemy. And he's trying to heap condemnation onto you. Now there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Conviction comes from the Lord. Conviction is a, a stern, uh, loving discipline. Like, hey, I don't have this for you. I have so much in store for you. This isn't what I have in store for you. And sometimes it's a loud rebuke. Uh, I remember Romy one time was going for a pot of hot water. We had put some some uh, cinnamon sticks in the in the water, and we're just trying to. This was before oils, uh, before diffusers. So we we're just trying to make the house smell good. And and I remember her just so curious. And she's barely walking. She goes to reach up, and I yelled, "No, don't do that!" And and it scared her, and she started crying. And I'm like, I picked her up, and I'm like, "No, no, no! You don't want to. I, you know, don't grab stuff." And of course, I should have put the pot in right. I wasn't thinking as a parent, but. We get those from the Lord and from the Holy Spirit all the time. Don't. That's going to hurt you. That's going to, don't. That's going to damage your marriage. Don't. That's going to damage your kids. Don't. And we get that. And sometimes we're like, you know, you feel that. You feel that check in your spirit. But I tell you, the more, the more and more you don't listen to that, the quieter it gets. I'll let you know that. You can quench the Holy Spirit's voice in your heart. But we get these we get this conviction of like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. I have more than this. But let me tell you this. Some people say, well, how long should conviction last? As long as it takes you to forgive, to ask for forgiveness, to ask for repentance. As long as it takes for you to ask for repentance. That's it. That's it. Sometimes people think, oh, no, I did something wrong. I should carry this weight on me of, of shame and guilt because I did this wrong thing. It's like, that's not the Lord. He doesn't have that for you. What are you doing? That's your conscience put on by something, by the world or by whatever. That's your conscience thinking you need to carry around that, drag that weight because it's pendants for doing something wrong. The Lord's like, that's not me. I don't condemn. I don't, I'm not weighty. And he says, if you get convicted, ask for forgiveness. Repeat immediately. Repent. And then it's gone. And then it's gone. That's how you know it's the Lord's voice. Condemnation is from the enemy. Conviction is from the Father. 
I love a quote uh, from Peter Lord, Hearing God. He has a book called Hearing God. He says, 90% of what God wants to say to you is encouragement. I love that because it's so true. I look back in my life and I'm like, man, yeah, he basically just wants to tell me how much he loves me and how special he made me and how specially he designed me for this or for that. And when it comes to sin, so many times Christians think, and people that aren't Christians, they think, oh, there's a bunch of no lists in, in, in Christianity. But I'll tell you this. No, he just doesn't want you to hurt yourself. That's what sin is. Sin is just pain, death, attached to something that looks shiny, but it's like a trap. And he's just trying to tell you, no, don't. It's going to kill you. When the Lord speaks to your heart, it's to give encouragement. Oh, where am I? Philippians 4. Sorry, I'm all over the place. Philippians 4, 6, verse 7. It says this. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace that of uh, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I, I, I want to read it in another translation. I, I love that translation, but uh, the message translation does a, such an amazing job of of opening this up, and I want to read it. It says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petition and praise shape your worry into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for the good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. <laughs> I love that. Because we just heard the peace that passes understanding when it's like, I don't even know what that means. And, and the message opens it up. Oh, that's what he's talking about. He takes away the worry and puts peace in there. Listen, it's always peace. The Lord is never going to confuse you or give you anxiety the lord is always when he speaks it has peace all over it that's how you know what his tone sounds like the timbre of his voice it's always peace it's always love and it's never condemning and so when you look at his voice and you say how does it sound what does it look like the first one you dictate, okay, is it my voice? Is it his voice? Then is okay, I feel that it's his voice, so I'm going to use the word as a guide. Is this it? Is this what he says in the word of God? And if you're reading it on a daily basis, you'll be able to recall that. I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit will bring a verse up in a heartbeat. But you have to put it in you first. But he'll bring up a verse and you'll be like, oh, there it matches. Then ask people around you. And if you don't have people around you, find people. Find a small group. That's the whole point of small group. It's not to have another meeting. It's so that we have people around us that can help us with that part of it. Is this what God has in store for me? Find a men's group. Find something. Go to man camp. Shameless plug. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is that you have, find some people around you. And the second one is you always know that it comes with peace. Always. Always. Even a conviction comes with peace. Because it's like, oh my God, I shouldn't be doing this. This isn't what I should be doing. God has more for me than this. And the third and final point is this. Three things to physically do that God's calling you to. The way to, the, and this is honestly, I pulled it from my life. Three things that I do on a regular basis that are physical and in front of me. And the first one is this. It says, make time. Make time for God. You have to prioritize time with God. In fact, I love Dr. Charles Stanley says this. He says, make time with God a priority, pursue it, and persist. We make appointments for everything in the world. If you probably could pull your calendar, you're like, you have an appointment for 
you know, whatever. The, the lamest stuff is probably on your calendar with an appointment. Make an appointment for God. Make an appointment. Make it happen. You have to literally make time for God because if you don't actually set apart time, it won't happen. Your day will get busy because guess who doesn't want you to have time? The enemy. He doesn't want you to have time. So how about when you go to have time with God, there's like nine things come into your mind. You're like, oh, wait, I got I to gotta screw in that bolt that's on the table right now. Right? And it's like you go and then, and then you look for the screw and there's no screws. I got to go to the store real quick. And then you go to the store and there's no time for God. <laughs> Always happens. And I don't know who, if it's you or if it's just me, but I know that when I don't set time for God, it disappears. And, and I'll tell you this too. Our bodies are warring against God. Our flesh I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but when you start to read the word or you start to, you start to get tired a little bit, have you ever had, has that ever happened to you? You're like, whew, oh man, it's like I just had coffee and it's only like 11 o'clock and, I, and for some reason I'm super tired. It's like our bodies don't want to be. It's like the flesh is warring against God. And so we have to put it in. That's what Paul talks about, submission. Bring our bodies up. No body, I'm going to do it. Mind, I'm going to focus. Stop thinking about things. I'm going to focus. Set an appointment for God. The second one is this. Make space. Make space. Solitude and silence is so important. I had a friend say, well, I do, I do, I have my time with the Lord while I do something else. I'm like, that's not time with the Lord. I even know, even with my relationship with my wife, if I'm not looking at her, Women, I don't know if you guys do this, but men too, if you're not, if, if someone's not paying attention, they're doing something else, it's like, I, I might as well not even be talking. I've learned in my marriage after 16 years that I, when she's saying something important, I, I, I pause the TV, put it down, and I, I bought DVR just for this, <laughs> pause it, and I turn, and I'm like, okay, go ahead. What are you saying? She needs my undivided attention. She wants to tell me something important, and I better listen. In the same way with the Lord, finding time to be silent and finding some solitude. Uh, Charles Spurgeon always talked about the closet. Finding a place where you get away and you just you and him. And just be quiet and listen. And the way I do it is I spend time just talking to God, just talking to him and telling him how awesome he is. I love David's verse because there's some keys in there where... Uh, um, um, Psalms 100 something. It says, <laughs> good pastor. Um, he says, he says, um, enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart, enter his courts with praise. So I know that that's how I kind of want to enter in, right? So I just start thanking him. I start praising him and I put on some worship music or whatever it is. And like, yeah, Jesus, you're awesome. God, father, you're awesome. Holy spirit, come on. And, and I just spend some time with him and then I just stop and I just wait. And I just listen. I say, Lord, what do you want to say? And my mind tries to wander. And I'll, I have a pen, pen with me. And I usually, a pen and paper. And I usually write that down real quick so it doesn't constantly come back to me. And I'll just say, Lord, I just want to, I just want to hear from you. And for years, I used to journal. I used to ask the Lord. I'd write down a prayer. And then I would just start writing what I feel the Lord is saying to me. And I'll start writing it out. And before I'd realize it, all of a sudden, I have a page of the Lord speaking to me. We're like, what? You need silence and solitude. You need to have moments with him. This is how you get to know his voice. This is how when you're in a big, busy area and all of a sudden there's noise going on and there's things happening and everything's stirring around you and there's hectic. It's like a storm, like the hurricane we just got is all going on all around you and you hear the voice of God. That's how it happens because you've been having time of solitude, silence with him. And you know what that voice sounds like. And everything could be stirring around you. The storm could be happening around you, but you hear the voice of God. That's how you do it. The third and last one is this. Make it happen. Make it happen. This one is basically just titled obedience. Obedience. I love Oswald Chambers' quote with this. He says, 
Confess it quickly. Make it right with God. Be reconciled to that person. Do it now. Whatever the Lord's telling you to do, don't wait. Don't think about it. Don't try and talk yourself out of it. Do it now. Because I'll tell you what, I, I know for me, I have a great way of trying to rationalize something. I try and rationalize myself out of doing what God has called me to do. When the Lord says it, don't do anything else. Write it down, whatever you need to do, but get up and do it. Start doing it. And I'll tell you this, this is where, this is the hinge pin because this obedience actually opens up more understanding of who he is. Your obedience opens your ears even more. Because what happens is obedience pulls away the selfish part of who I am. That soul or, or the, the mind, will, and emotion, that area of our life gets pulled back even more. The more I'm obedient, the more it gets pulled back. The more I start, I can't hear my own thoughts anymore because it gets pulled back. That area gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Obedience is one of the biggest keys to hearing God's voice. In fact, I tell some people sometime, I tell people when they say, man, I just haven't heard the Lord. I feel like I'm in a place of silence. Listen, sometimes the Lord has that for you. Sometimes it's something, but he's told you you're going there if that's the case. But sometimes when it's just a time of silence and, and a desert, I ask them this. They say, I can't hear the Lord. I don't know what's going on. I said, what was the last thing he said to you? What was the last thing he said to you? And what was the last thing he called you to do to be in obedience? And is he just waiting for you to be obedient? Because it actually might be the next word for you might be at the spot that you're being obedient. And he's just waiting to tell you something and waiting for you to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. And then finally you're obedient. He's like, okay, let me tell you next. And sometimes that's it. What did the Lord say to you last? And what was he calling you to? And maybe, maybe he's just waiting for you to do that. So many times we ask the Lord for more. And he's like, I have a full plate for you. I have a full plate. It's full of amazing things that I've called you to. And you want more of this. But once you start diving into this, you'll start getting full. You'll start getting fed. You'll start getting what I've called you to get. And he's called us to this. Listen, God's voice is something that we have to first want it. I want to hear your voice. And I think one of the scariest things that people think of is if I start to hear God's voice, he's going to tell me to do things I don't want to do. It's one of the biggest fears. Let me tell you this. The most amazing thing about hearing God's voice is it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. And as I start to get to know him, and I start to spend time with him. I start to get his heart. I start to understand who he is. And my heart becomes his heart. And so as I start to want what he wants, then when he asks me to do something, it's because I want to do it, not because he's asking me to do something I don't want to do. It's all this circular relationship. And as I become closer to him, I want what he wants. And his heart becomes my heart. I don't know if you've ever had a friend that you hang out with and you just start, you start acting like them. You start saying the same words as them. You know, you start joking the same way and you're like, where did this come from? It's the same thing with the fathers. You start having that intimate relationship. Your heart becomes his heart. And all of a sudden, the things you used to want you don't want anymore. And the things that you never thought you would want, you want now. And so when the Lord asks you into those things, it's not because you don't want it. It's because he's prepared you enough with your relationship with them that by the time you go there, you want it. It's this intimate relationship between a shepherd and his sheep. He loves us so much. And he's got so much life in store for us. 
and I feel sometimes like I'm not taking hold of all of it. And I don't know if you feel that way sometimes, but it's because I don't push into understanding who he is and to spending time with him. And when I start doing that, what happens is I start seeing life become, become abundant. Not perfect, but abundant. So we're just going to pray. I think I'm, I'm way too late. So we're just going to pray. And I'm just going to pray over everybody here just for a hunger for the Father, a hunger to know him and to hear him and to hear what he has in store for us. You know, one thing I, I want to do is we bow our heads real quick. At the very top of this, it said, that scripture, if, you're, if you hear his voice, you belong to him. If you're saying to yourself right now, I don't know if I belong to him. I've never heard God's voice. I don't know if I have a relationship with him, but I want it. I want this relationship that you talk about. I want this relationship that the word talks about. I want to have an intimate relationship with him. And I don't want to leave tonight without this or this morning without this. If you're saying to yourself, I, I, I don't know if I belong to him, but I want to. Right now, I want to belong to him. What I want you to do is just raise your hand up. And there's nothing magical about you raising your hand. It's you just declaring to the Lord that I want you. I want you in my life. So right now, if this is you, I want you to raise your hand up high. I see your hands. Yeah, all over the place. If this is you and you're raising your hand up high, I want you to know that it is literally God. God, the Father is so happy with you. He's loving on you, right? He's so excited. He's so excited for you to get to know him and you to take hold of what he has in store for you. He's so excited that all of heaven is rejoicing right now. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for every single hand that went up today that they are calling out for you. And right now, you are placing in them the Holy Spirit. Right now, as they raise their hands, as they declare, I want you to be Lord of my life. That's what you're doing, is you're raising your hand and saying, Lord, I want you to be Lord of my life. He's putting in you right now the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, you are mine. You are mine, and now you can hear my voice. You are my sheep, and I am your good shepherd. Yeah. Father God, I also just pray for every single person in this room, Lord. Holy Spirit, that you would just pour into us a hunger, a hunger to hear you. Father, give us boldness to set apart time for you. Give us strength to keep to it, to say, Lord, I'm not going to deviate from this. I want to hear you. I want to be persistent. I want to pursue it. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want it to happen in my life. Father God, I just ask for that grace right now over every single person in this room. Holy Spirit, that you would just place a hunger to hear you, a hunger to chase after you, a, a hunger to draw close to you. Father God, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you that you right now are just allowing this grace to happen, allowing this blessing to be poured out over your children. You want this more than they do. So I, I speak into that in the name of Jesus because that's what you want. I know your will, and your will is this, that you want them to draw close to you. Father, we thank you, Father God. We thank you that you have so much life in store for every person in this room. Lord, continue to reveal it to us. Continue to show us. Continue to give us understanding and revelation. In the name of your awesome, amazing, wonderful, glorious name, Jesus Christ.